Hello and welcome to GMI, the Guitar and Music Institute podcast episode number 45. Today I'm talking with a professor who is a music teacher and also a part-time programmer. His name is Adam Bailiff and he's created Private Music Studio 2 and it's for music teachers. So perhaps you're a music teacher and listening to this or perhaps you have a teacher and you might want to tell them about this app. Adam's going to tell you all about it in the interview that's coming up. If you're a teacher or if you have a teacher or you're thinking of becoming a teacher, you might want to check this podcast out. In my effort to keep things shorter and sweeter at the beginning of the podcasts, I just want to say that GMI is powered by Shopify and we promote the Shopify platform. So if you come over to the guitarmusicinstitute.com website and you go down, you can see a link there which helps support this channel and you'll get 14 days free to to check out Shopify and actually get online. There's never been a better time to go online. So, without any further ado, coming up is that interview with Adam. Adam, welcome to the show. It's great to see you. It's great to be here. Thanks, Jed. Yeah, so um, this is a first for the show. This is, I think, I'm probably wrong in saying this, I've got this wrong, but I think you're the first ever professor on the GMI podcast. Okay, well, I'm honoured. Thank you. (laughs) Well, let's just knock something out of the park right away because there's a lot of chat about professors. So the first thing is, do you wear a moleskin jacket that's got those leather patches and corduroy (laughs) trousers? You know, my dad had one of those, but I don't have a a jacket like that, unfortunately. What is it with those things? But Was your dad a professor as well? Uh, No, he was an engineer, though. All right, uh, You know... academic in his own right so <laughs> so do you think jackets are actually getting better as the decades go by that we don't need those elbow uh, patches? i guess so yeah we don't need the the patches to get us through <laughs> <laughs> now adam you are the second clarinetist that we've had on from america in a very short space of time the first one's living in scotland but you really are in america where about are you yeah i'm actually in idaho so i teach in a small town called rexburg idaho and I teach in a university called Brigham Young University, Idaho. We have a campus in Utah that's quite well known, um, but I teach at the Idaho campus. Fantastic. Now, just so I get this right, because I don't want to offend you, should I call you Prof? Oh, hey, that's totally up to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, I'll just Adam call you. Adam is fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason you're on is I received an email from you. I don't know how I got it. You got my email, but you, you sent it out and it was uh, I was intrigued. And what it's called is Private Music Studio 2. So the this is an app. Uh, and I want you to tell the listeners all about it. And interestingly, 50% of this readership is in America, but I don't really know if that's relevant anymore. Possibly not. It doesn't matter where you are, because it looks very, very impressive. The only question I have right off the bat is, it's called Private Music Studio 2, so I'm assuming there was a Private Music Studio 1. That's true. This is my kind of second crack at this app. Uh, So, you know, I'm a clarinet teacher, but I also have a passion for Apple technology, for I dabble in programming. And so this was a project to really learn how to write iPhone and iPad apps. And it's an app that I've wanted that I couldn't find. So as a private teacher teaching clarinet students in private lessons, um, I've tried many different systems to track, uh, you know, their progress, the things that they're working on and find ways to uh, communicate with them how they're doing and and how they're making progress. And so I started to learn Xcode and uh, started to learn the Swift programming language and came up with this app. My first uh, uh, app, Private Music Studio One, came out um, at the beginning of this year. And, uh, you know, Apple, they've improved some things. They've made some new technologies available that makes it a little easier on developers. And I just decided to, to do a new version that would, that would work that much better. So assuming if you're doing all the programming, that's why it's not an Android as well. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, maybe someday. Um, but I started with iOS because that's what I, was, uh, that's what I had. That's what I was familiar with. 
um, maybe Android someday, because I know that that's, uh, you know, a large market. So before we go into how the app actually functions, one thing that I find incredible is that you've got it in English, French, German, Italian and Spanish. I mean, talk about throwing the net out there. That is fantastic. How did you go about doing that? Yeah. So, you know, Xcode makes it relatively easy to provide what they call localizations for those countries. Um, And I wanted to get the app in as many hands as I could and have language not be a barrier. So um, I, you, you have to go in and you look at all the text and you provide a translation for, for all that text. Now, fortunately, my app doesn't have a lot of text, so it wasn't too demanding to do that. Okay. Can you actually choose the, your language from the, the opening screens? Or, it will, or? Yeah, it will automatically adapt to the language that your iPhone is set to. So if you're already using your iPhone in French, the app will automatically open with, with French support. Okay. Why don't you tell people, teachers specifically, because it is for them, Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Why should they get this free app, I uh, I hasten to add, unless you want unlimited students where there's a very small fee of, I think it's $2.99, is that right? $2.99, yeah. Yeah, which is next to nothing. Why why should, because isn't there a feeling nowadays that there's an app for just about everything, even when we don't need it? Why is this so useful? Yeah. So, and, and, you know, this was the app I always wanted in my teaching was to be able to have all my students in one place. Um, it's really a database app for your students and uh, to be able to see how they're doing, track their progress, but more importantly, have them be able to connect on their device and see their updates and know what they should be practicing throughout the week and know kind of how they're progressing throughout a, a semester. So before this, I've gone from just, you know, note paper to annotating PDFs. I tried OneNote for a while, um, and all of them were okay, but they just lacked, to me, the uh, ease of use and also the ability to have students connect in um, easily to subscribe to their lessons. So it's a really a database for your private students. And so you have a list of the students. Um, you can track and you enter in what they do each week. And the, the app is free so that the students can download it and they get to connect and use it uh, how they need for their own personal use without any fee. And then the, the small fee to unlock additional uh, unlimited students is really for teachers and to hopefully offset just some of my costs in developing it. You talk about technique and exercise assignments may be created and saved uh, as templates. Oh. I take it you don't mean the actual musical notation itself. No, that's true. So I'm I'm tracking, uh, you know, they're working on these scales this semester or they're working on these uh, etudes. Um, I'm just listing those out. And the reason I put in support and I call them templates is, as you know, as a private teacher, I'm saying the same things over and over again uh, to each student. And so I can enter in assignments for one student, but then reuse those multiple times for others. And that's why they're templates. But there is no notation. There's there uh, isn't, uh, you know, it's not a sheet music app, uh, per se. It's just a a database, really, for teachers. Uh, That regurgitating the same old stuff is how I make my living. (laughs) 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 So so let's talk about uh, when you say that the program, when you say that you can't add, can you embed notation into it? Not at this point. Is that something you would like to do? Uh, Possibly. And there might be a way to do that, you know, just with support for PDFs, because so much, you know, when we uh, are scanning music, you know, I love my iPad because I have all my music on it in one place. Um, So if that was a feature that I think people wanted, I think it could be something we could probably add. Can you take me through a teacher gets your app? How long is it going to take them to actually set this up, say they've got 15 students, how, how would they go about that? How easy would yeah. that be? Yeah, and I uh, tried to integrate, I did integrate with the contacts on your iPhone or iPad. So if your students are already in your address book or contacts, it's it will literally just take you about two button presses to enter them in. Uh, you just hit a plus button to add a student. You can open up your contacts and choose the one that you want and it will edit, it will import their phone and their email. 
Um, so uh, at the university, we function off semesters. And so I've organized the app a little bit around that way. So after you've added a student and their contact info is there, you uh, just click add a semester and you could, you know, for us, we're in fall 2020 right now. That's the semester I'm teaching in. But the semester could be of any length. It could be a year. It could be a month, whatever uh, the teacher wants. And it asks you how many lessons are you going to teach them in that time period? And all, then it, all the lessons get set up. And that's really all there is to to adding in a student and starting to use the app. What you said there was quite interesting. You said you could add students from your contacts and it would add their email. What about things like data protection and, and how does that all work? Yeah, so the student obviously would have you to give you permission to have their email, to have a phone number. Um, all of this is synced via iCloud. And so I don't see any personal information or data. It's all secure, um, synced via iCloud between your devices. And, you know, as long as the students give you permission to have that on your phone, that you would only see that as their, as their teacher. And once your semester has finished, uh-huh. does the data get erased? How does that work? No, it stays on there. So you can go back, and that's another thing I really like, is I can go back and look uh, at last year and see what a student did, see what they worked on, see how far they progressed. And so it becomes kind of a, a historical record for that student. And I have students you know, at the university for four to five years, and it's nice just to be able to look back and see what we did. One of the things that I've found quite interesting about this is that you allow audio to be recorded within the app. I've noticed in my own personal tuition that more and more kids would just get out their phones, copyrights out the window these days. There's a book and I'll say, let's look at this. Do you have this book? No, but wait a minute. I'll just use my phone. Click there. That's it in there. Or they'll video me. Um, are we at the point of overload here with that? <laughs> with, with, with the app? Do you have the ability to record video, for example? The the app doesn't record video. So this this feature was a request from one of my colleagues she said, could we, uh, you know, record in a, an example of me performing, the teacher performing something so the student could then listen back to it later? Or could we record part of the lesson? And so inside of lessons, there's four categories. There's the technique portion. There's an etude repertoire and then just other notes and so each of those sections has a record button and you can hit record and the idea is that these would just be small audio snippets just a a demo of of what we were working on in the lesson so that when they're practicing later they could go back and review that recording how have people felt about the app and have you noticed any differences in age groups and talking about teachers here Yeah. And, you know, the app is pretty young. Uh, This version just hit the app store about two weeks ago. And so I've been mostly just in uh, beta test mode with this. And uh, I'm using it in all my teaching. A lot of my colleagues are trying it out and using it. And so we're using it mostly probably with university age students. I think it would also work well for high school students. Um, I don't think it would work as well for younger kids that maybe don't have their own device or have their own phone or iPad um, to use with it. How does that work with the iPad? Excuse my ignorance, but if you have it on your iPhone, I'm assuming that there can be very easy synchronization across the iPads. Yeah, absolutely. All of the sync is built in by default. It just works uh as long as you're logged in to your the same iCloud account on both devices, all of the data syncs automatically. And uh, that's another reason I actually rewrote the app for version two is Apple's made it very easy for developers to include that um, ability to sync between devices. So did you learn to program, Adam, just to make this app? You know, I kind of this is kind of true in my performance, too. If I have a concert coming up, I tend to practice more <laughs> and and really prepare for that concert. And so I just took this on as a project I wanted to do. And uh, that kind of spurred me along in learning how to how to code and how to learn Swift. Do you think there's an affinity with musicians and mathematics and programming? I do. You know, music theory and math, I think, really go hand in hand. And uh 
I, I've had a, a little bit of affinity for programming, even back to my uh, college days with my dissertation. I wrote a very simple uh, application that accompanied my dissertation. Uh, not as complicated as writing iPhone apps, but it's always been just kind of an interest of mine. But. I've always been intrigued by programming, but I just find it so dry in the fact that a semicolon out of place can destroy <laughs> Oh, <everything>. I know. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I hear you. So um, <laughs> how, how do you put up with that? I mean, how easy or hard have you found it? You know, it, it has been kind of a steep learning curve for me. You know, my first version of this app from just starting at square one and not really knowing much of anything, it took me 10 months to write that first wow. version. And the second version I started in March. And so I'm getting a little better. It's, you know, this one took me maybe six months to do. Uh, and I don't do it for my living. I, I do it at nights and on weekends, just kind of as uh, something to keep my mind my mind going but it's only 6.1 megabytes it's it's not a, a, a huge app it's not big yeah do you know numbers of people how many have downloaded it or is that top secret uh it's not a, a large number at this point you're you're my first big publicity push here in kind of getting this out in the open i've i've given it to my friends and we've used it in, in house a little bit but i haven't really publicized it much till now what about things like the actual images used and the uh, the user interface? How tricky is is that? And are you did you have to get outside help for that part? No, I did I did all of that. And uh, again, this these advances in Swift and Swift UI and Xcode, what Apple's done, has made interface building I think more accessible. But I, you know, I just enjoy, I enjoy tech. I enjoy the design part of this. And um, uh, I started just to map these out in a graphics app, you know, out, away from Xcode, away from the programming environment, just how would I want it to look? And then I did my best to kind of match and, and mimic that. How do you actually look at something like this and then judge whether it's being successful or not? I know that there's there's a phrase for this and it's just gone out my head, but basically tracking something to see the effectiveness of using this as opposed to, say, a jotter, <laughs> the old sure. Mark I pencil and piece of paper. Yeah, sure. And I think it's just the amount of people that I can get to try it. Uh, I get uh, great feedback from my friends and colleagues that try things out and they give me feedback that I hadn't even thought of or, you know, because uh, I've designed it with the way my mind works and how I like to organize information. But the more people I can get to try it, that that's where the feedback becomes really valuable. Now, you're a clarinetist and you're teaching yes. clarinetists, but uh -huh. yep. this is for any instrument, isn't it? It's for any instrument. That's right. And I wanted it to be open enough uh, that it could be used in, in any setting. Were you tempted or have you been tempted because it's going into the hands of teachers to actually put, in this case, clarinet specific help images, sounds, whatever, hmm. into the app. I wanted it to be really open, again, because I wanted to reach a large number of people with it. So I wanted pianists to use it, singers, brass, strings. I, I really wanted it to be open. Uh, I have another app I'm working on that is focused just on clarinet repertoire, and that one will be much more narrowly, narrowly focused. But for this one, I wanted it to be just open to any teacher. So... How long will it take for that one to see the the light of day, Adam? <laughs> it's uh, I would say it's probably halfway done. Um, I'm hoping to have it out maybe January ish. Let's t tell us a little about where you actually teach and, and the place, just so people around the world can get a little idea of, about your life there and and what it's like. Yeah, thank you. I teach in, uh, again, uh, Rexburg, Idaho. So Rexburg is a town of about 25,000 people, but 16,000 of those people are the college students. So it's a, really? small, <laughs> it's, a small it's a small town with a really nicely sized university. Oh, wait a minute. Is it one of these places where they kill everybody when they get over 25 or something? Because <laughs> everybody well, will be tell so you what, young. <laughs> It's it's kind of a ghost town in in August, you know that, that summer break time. It's a ghost town, and then it gets gets crazy again when everybody comes back. That is amazing. So you're saying that seventy percent of the people in this town are students? 
Yeah, that's that's right. And, the, you know, this uh, university was Rick's College before it was Brigham Young University, Idaho. It was founded in uh, the late 1800s. Who's and Brigham so it Young? Has, Brigham Young is uh, was one of the presidents of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So we're a private university owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And like I said, uh, we have a campus in Provo, Utah, which is the largest, the larger campus. We have a campus here in Idaho, and you might be surprised we have a campus in Hawaii, which might be a nice move someday. Uh, but <laughs> I was going to say, why not? You know, if you're going to teach anywhere, why, why not there? Yeah. So do yeah. the students have to be, uh, is, am I right in thinking you're Mormons? Yes. So uh-huh. do you have to be a Mormon to go to that place? You don't. You don't. You, you do have to agree to live an honor code um, okay. to live by the, the standards of our church. But you don't have to be a member. All right. Okay. And so does the Church of Latter-day Saints actually own the the whole shooting match? They do. Yep. I always remember the Mormons. I always found it weird growing up in a, a working class scheme in Scotland. For some reason, they would always send these guys. We'd always be really uh, quite taken by them. But they were always about six foot three. <laughs> and they were pencil thin and they had uh-huh. sort of crew cuts and they always impeccably dressed and they, they would always have these things which we later found out were American footballs and, and we, we thought they were oh, rugby yeah. balls and they uh-huh, would come yeah. round every single year tapping on the doors. They were always very polite and I always kind of almost felt sorry for them because it must have been quite an alien kind of culture. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, did, do you have to did you have to do that or, or is yeah that... we I, I did we have a large missionary program uh-huh. and we have about 80,000 missionaries around the world in every country and they go out two by two in companionships to talk about Jesus Christ and to tell people about the church and the opportunities that are there uh, I went to California though <laughs> for for my mission. I was in Northern California. Yeah, that must have been a so. Tough again, one, they yeah. go all over the place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in terms of the job that you do, are you actually teaching people just to play instruments, or are you teaching them with regards playing for the the Church of Latter Day Saints? Oh, that's a great question. Really, really kind of both. So I'm preparing future clarinet performers, uh, many future band directors, those that want to teach public school. Um, We have a large number of music education students, those that want to teach band, orchestra, choir, elementary music. Um, And so I'm training, we're training them to be music professionals, um, to go out and be teachers, performers, go to grad school. Many of the performance majors will go to graduate school next. But we're doing it in an environment that is centered around um, the gospel of Jesus Christ Mm -hmm. and and those those uh, standards of family standards and values. And so it's really a lucky and lovely place to teach because we get to combine music and our love of music but also our faith. I think, um, am I right in saying that the the Mormon church in terms of production value is right up there, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I've, I've not seen loads of it, but I've seen some bits and pieces of it, and there's always huge choirs, big orchestras. I, right, I, I yeah. I am right in saying that, aren't I? Yeah, you, you're probably familiar with the, the Tabernacle Choir. The, yeah, you know, that's what I'm talking uh, about. Yeah. yeah have, you, so, have you had a shot at that? Yeah, so the Tabernacle Choir uh, added an orchestra in around the year 1998 or so and so i was able to play in the orchestra and then the choir behind us and that's they're still a very vibrant group i think they're the longest running uh live broadcast weekly broadcast in the world um they they do these music and the spoken word every sunday morning um with the choir and orchestra at temple square so how big is the choir Oh, how big is the choir? Um, I would say it's probably 200-ish members and then a uh, full orchestra as well. I know we're getting and, a little bit off piece here, but... Yeah, no, that's okay. How are things going on with the whole COVID thing? Are, are you just plowing on regardless or uh, what's happening there then? With our teaching, uh, with my teaching specifically? Uh, i more about the choir. <laughs> the choir, yeah. All that you know, spittle getting knocked about. Yeah. 
So they are doing a little bit of both. They're doing some distanced uh, recording projects and things. Uh, because they have such a rich tradition of broadcasts and recording, they're able to go and broad rebroadcast past performances. Um, so they are still doing the weekly broadcast, but some of those are recorded from previous years. Okay, I've actually got a, a question. Here we are talking about Europe, and here I am going to ask you a slightly <laughs> philosophical question. I've never understood about the Mormons. Am I right in saying that you guys believe that only 144,000 people are going to heaven? That's not true. Oh, I think well, you might put, be. Put me right on that you, one. I think you might be getting as confused with some other churches, possibly. So but you think no. everyone's going to heaven? Is professes faith in Christ. Faith in Christ, that's right, yeah. So who am yeah. I thinking of? Is is that the... Well, I know the Jehovah's Witnesses Jehovah's have, Witnesses. you know... I beg my, I'm sorry. You see, folks, that's okay. I've just completely ruined the whole interview <laughs> and insulted Adam into the bargain. Oh, so right. anyway, let's just finish by talking once more about the app. What What is your Great. hopes for the app? Adam. I would hope that it gets in the hands of as many people as I can find, that they can give me feedback, that I can f can change or fix things that don't work the way it should, and that I can add features over time. You know, I, th I can see this, like you mentioned, maybe having a sheet music functionality. That might be a popular feature in the future. And I think there are others. I would love to see, uh, just see it get in the hands of lots of teachers and students. And really, it's about the students, right? Uh, I want to be able to help students um, progress faster. And I think they all have these phones in their pockets. This is a way for their teacher to communicate with them um, additionally throughout the week. Have you thought about adding a metronome? Uh, you know, th uh, that would be great as well. I have uh, several favorite metronome apps that, that um, work really well. Um, and so I guess the question is, is it good just to have another another app that could be your metronome, or do I want it built in? And I don't know. I don't know yet if I if what the better answer is. It's a funny thing that strikes me what you were saying there about they have all got these phones in their yeah. pockets, and kind of it's um, a paradox, isn't it? Because the fact that they've got those phones in their pockets is maybe one of the reasons why you might not be engaging in maybe more wholesome well, i don't want to say wholesome uh not wholesome um well just the the temptation to be on the phone doing other stuff right is is a prevalent thing they can be a great distraction right um yeah and and it's like a lot of technology it can be used for really great things but also some really bad things and so i think we just have to educate them and uh steer them in the right direction for how it should be used Okay, so when can we look forward to Private Music Studio 3? Three? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> I guess it depends on how much feedback I get from this <laughs> and, and ideas for improvement. Uh, no, I'm just excited to have this one out there. Again, I've been using it. I think it's, I think it's a good tool. Um, I, I hope some people try it out. And so do I, because I think you're you're a very brave man to take on programming. And I actually have, uh, a while ago, actually project managed uh, the creation of an app. I wasn't uh, actually building it, but it's there's uh, so much work involved. So you have my unending <laughs> admiration. Well, well, thank you. Adam, I know you've got another class to teach, No Rest for the Wicked. Um, That's right. <laughs> and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day, just so everybody knows Adam's, is it 2 o'clock, 2.30 where you are, Adam? It's 2.30, that's right. It's 2.30 in the, 30 afternoon. In the yep. afternoon, and it's 9.30 where I am. So it's been fantastic that Adam has dropped everything just to do this interview. <laughs> so thanks very much, Professor. It's been brilliant. Another first for GMI, and I wish you all the best with the app. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, folks, that's us for uh, another podcast episode. A little shorter than usual, but short and sweet is sometimes good. Adam has furnished me with some codes that you can use to unlock some of the features in the app and those will be on the Guitar Music Institute website so come to guitarmusicinstitute.com check out this specific podcast which is for Private Music Studio 2 and you're looking for Adam Balaf, you'll be able to get those codes and, and use them. 
I've already got another interview lined up and I'm looking forward to this one. This is an incredible thing. It's a new invention. So uh, it's just a case of trying to get a time where we can both talk to each other. I'm not going to tell you any more than that, but uh, yeah, it's, it's quite, quite interesting. It's just astonishing what's happening in the world of technology. This is a physical new technology that's coming out for instrumentalists. From me, Jed Brocky, thank you for listening and I'll hopefully be speaking to you with someone interesting very, very soon. Bye for now.